much, Corey, and thank all of you for just honoring the Word of God that is getting ready to be preached. You all may be seated. Thank you, band. You guys can be seated as well. Can we give it up for our band today? As always, they do an amazing job leading us in worship. And I'm just so excited to have all of you here with us as we are kicking off a brand new series that we are calling Be Christmas. Before we kind of get to what Be Christmas is all about, I'm just actually curious. Have any of you ever noticed that around Christmas, that Christmas time really is a magnifier? Christmas is a magnifier. When things are, are going great, going well, Christmas time can make the good even better. But that's also true about the opposite. Sometimes whenever we go through things that seem to be hard the rest of the year, it could be extremely difficult this time of year, around Christmas. I know last week, actually, my wife um, lost her grandmother. And this past Wednesday, we had her funeral service. And at the end of the funeral service, we actually heard from Elvis Presley. Her grandma loved Elvis. And we heard the song, Blue Christmas, right? It'll be a blue Christmas without you. I'll be so blue just thinking about you. I'm not going to sing it. Don't ask me to do that. But in that moment, I was really thinking how much of a magnifier Christmas really is, that this year there's going to be an empty seat at the table for dinner, that we're not going to be able to go and, and to give her the gift that we had already bought her. And so Christmas, it's, it's a magnifier. And so with that in mind, what I actually want to talk to you guys today about is overcoming offenses overcoming offenses. And I want to talk to you about it because I've just seen God do such a work in my life where I am starting to get over those things that used to hold me back. Now, here's the deal. I don't know what it may be for you. It might be something small. Now, for me, whenever like I'm driving and I'm in traffic, right, and, and I'm in the lane that you're supposed to be in and all these other people are the lane that they are not supposed to be in, and if I kind of slow down and stop and let someone over, like, they should automatically give me a little head nod or that wave that says, oh, you're so godly, you're so righteous, thank you so much, you didn't have to do it. If I don't get that wave, I'm offended. I'm a little ticked off. Or if I go into a building and I see maybe somebody behind me, they could be right behind me or maybe some distance away, and I go to grab the door and hold the door open for them, if they just walk on by without saying thank you, I'm a little offended. I get a little ticked off. Maybe, maybe you're not like that, but maybe, maybe for you, it's when you're having a conversation with someone, and they instantly pull out their phone, and they're like, uh-huh, yep. You're like, will you please put that thing away? There is someone right in front of you trying to talk to you. And it's amazing, actually, uh, speaking of phones, how technology has opened up all kinds of doors and avenues to be offended, like uh, especially social media. Right? Like, hey, wait a minute, I follow you, follow you on Instagram, you don't follow me. Like, I'm liking all your pictures and commenting. You never comment on anything that I post. Or how about that really awkward conversation you might have to have whenever you know that you were friends with somebody, and then you look them up because you want to send them a picture or tag them in something, and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not your friend anymore. You must have unfriended me. What in the world is going on? I'm kind of offended. It happens all the time. And speaking of, of phones, some of you guys are like 24-hour responders when it comes to text messages. Like, if we have a close relationship, like, man, 15 minutes should be good enough. Maybe a half an hour. I'll give you 30 minutes. But 24 hours? You know, actually, a couple days ago, Corey, I, I, we were kind of texting back and forth. And you know what he did? He bubbled me. We were texting and having a conversation, and I sent him a text that demanded a response. And I saw the bubble come up, which means he is texting me back. And then the bubble disappears and no text comes through. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. We have a close enough relationship where I said, don't you dare bubble me again. You better tell me what you were <laughs> typing right now. It's so crazy how some of us can be so easily offended. And as we move into the holidays, right, there is always that person in the family that always comes late. They never really bring what they're supposed to or they never really contribute to the meal that you're having as a family. And not only do they not contribute anything to the family, the only thing they're bringing with them is some Tupperware so they can bring some of the food home with them. I don't know. Maybe that don't happen in your family. Maybe that's just my family. I don't know. 
I'm not throwing anybody under the bus this morning. You know, or, or, or we're having a conversation with, with family and all of us have kids and then one parent says uh, to another parent something about their kids. Oh, no, you did not bring my kids up in this conversation. You better back on up. You can talk whatever you want about me, but the moment you bring up somebody's kids, man, it is game on. And we can go through this season living so offended, and I'm telling you, it weighs us down so much. Now, those were just some small things, some kind of annoying things that might offend us. And I don't want to actually take light that there are maybe a lot of you here today that have actually experienced some heavy, some big offenses in your life as well. Some of you, you're, you're, you're maybe wounded or you're hurt. Maybe you've been betrayed. Maybe you've been lied about or misrepresented. Some of you guys are carrying around some, some really big offenses in this season. But my prayer is that you would go through not only this holiday season, but honestly, every single day of your life not living offended because we should not go into a time that we are celebrating the birth of Jesus while having a closed heart to the people that we should be loving. We shouldn't celebrate the grace of God that we have received without at the same time showing that grace to the people around us. See, that's why I want to talk to you about overcoming offenses because I have seen small things and I have seen big things really weigh people down so much that they cannot experience the life that they should be experiencing in Christ at this moment. It weighs them down. It bogs them down. They are emotionally and uh, spiritually hurt, and they're not able to walk in confidence in who they truly are in Christ. And so this morning, I actually want to teach you a phrase that I learned several years ago. I was listening to a pastor, and when he said that, it, when he said this, it so resonated in my heart. It's an incredible phrase, and I kind of tailored it to me, and so you can take this phrase and kind of tailor it to you however you want, but if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this phrase down. Here's what I try to tell myself over and over and over again in my life. I say, Shannon, your life is too short, and your calling is too great to live offended. Your life is too short, and your calling is too great to live offended. Let's think about this just for a second. Our life is too short, right? Our life is like a vapor. It's like a mist, the scripture says, that it's here today and we're gone tomorrow. You know, a couple months ago, we were in a series that we actually titled Before I Die, and in it, we, we looked at the importance of really living on purpose and living a life well because we recognize that our time is brief. You know, he's not going to like me saying this, but Isaac, my oldest son, who's sitting right over here, man, like I remember like holding him in one hand. I remember that like it was just yesterday, and today the dude's like wearing deodorant and fixing his hair and eating more than I ever dreamed that I could eat, you know, and he's growing up, and it's like that. Time is so short. But I want you to let you know that, I want to let you know that my calling is too great as well, but so is yours. Your calling is too great. And what are we called to? The scripture says that we're called uh, to be light to the world, that we are called to be salt of the earth. We're called to go out and make a difference by using the gifts that God has given us. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We are called to go out and live and love like Jesus would have loved people. That's what we're called to. Matter of fact, that's why we titled this series Be Christmas, because when you think about the Christmas season, you think about peace, hope, Enjoy, right? That, that, that the Prince of Peace, he came, right? Peace on earth, goodwill to, towards men, that we have a hope in Christ that he did come, that he did conquer sin and death, and because he has done all those things and because he has given us incredible life, we have joy in him. And, and it's something that we shouldn't just be focused on this time of year, but we should carry those three things, peace, hope, and joy, with us wherever we go every single day of our life. Man, we should be, Christians should be the most joyful people on the planet. But there are so many people I know walking around like uh, somber and they're walking around depressed. It's because they're carrying around so much weight and so many offenses that they don't need to carry around. You know, speaking of being the most joyful people on the planet, um, last week I was reading a post on Facebook from Dr. Jonathan Welton. Many of you rem will remember that name because he was here with us at conference last year, the last couple years, actually. And he said this. He said, the world actually thinks of and creates superheroes to save the world while the church is only blaming evil people for destroying it. 
when you think about that, like, man, we have the savior of the world. Like, Thor and Batman and Superman don't have nothing on Jesus, but we go around acting like we don't have anything to offer. Man, I'm telling you, as believers in Christ, we have something incredible to offer. We can give peace. We can give hope. We can give joy to a world that so desperately needs it. And I'm telling you right now, I pray that we would not go through this season living offended. You know what I want to do, actually? I want to look at one verse to kind of set the tone for where I want to go today, and then we'll kind of look at a couple other thoughts and prayers. But the verse is this. It's in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 21. It's an incredible verse I found this week. It says this, a person's wisdom yields patience. If you're wise, it's going to lead to or tend to go towards patience. And then it says, it is to one's glory. Everybody say glory. Glory Glory to overlook an offense. Now, I want to be right up front with you as we're going to unpack this and as we are going to see what it takes to overlook an offense. I want you to know that overlooking an offense is not the same as pretending like it never happened. Some of you guys have faced some some things that have really happened to you that have been serious, have been heavy, have been big offenses in your life. So as I talk about overlooking them, I'm not saying that we are going to pretend like they never happened. But it's overlooking in the fact that we uh, recognize that it already did happen, so we're going to make a conscious choice in the moment not to let it seep into our heart, not to let it get to us. As a matter of fact, this word overlook, it's just one word in English, but in the Hebrew, it's actually two words, and those two words are translated to pass over. It is to one's glory, stay with me, it is to one's glory to pass over an offense. And so if you're passing over something, what are you not doing? You're not staying in and dwelling in the moment or in the offense. You're going to pass over it. You're going to rise so high. You're going to get so close to God that you're not going to allow the offenses to attach itself to you, right? And it says it's to one's glory. That word glory actually means beauty, splendor. It's uh, precious. It's actually like a um, rare or a valuable uh, jewel is what that word glory represents. So in essence, what he's saying is you look good when you overlook an offense. You're attractive when you start to pass over offenses. Some of y'all need like a five-second makeover. It just includes looking over and passing over an offense. Because whenever we stay in the offense, whenever we allow what other people do to kind of uh, dictate how we are going to feel and how we are going to act, it weighs us down. And it, like I said earlier, it leads to depression and anxiety and living a life that is not the life that God called us to live. So it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Matter of fact, I, um, I'd like to put it this way. Uh, I found this quote from a guy named Rene Descartes. And if that name sounds from familiar, Rene Descartes, he actually is the philosopher that came up with this idea, I think, therefore I am. So the same dude that said that said this. He says, when anyone has offended me, I try to raise my soul so high that the offense cannot reach it. Man, that's beautiful. I raise my soul, my, my mind, my will, my emotions. I'm going to raise them so high. I'm going to uh, allow myself to get so close to God that I'm not going to allow the offense to reach me. I'm not going to allow it to affect me. What I want to do real quick is I want to unpack kind of two thoughts. Really, there are two prayers that we actually need to begin to pray as we are faced with Uh, things that might offend us, whether they be the small things or the big things. We're going to start with the small, and we're kind of going to move in to the bigger things. But the first prayer, if you're taking notes, I really need you to write this down. This isn't just good information, but this is life-changing stuff right here. As you begin to pray little prayers like this, the first thing is this. God, I need your help. I need your help. We recognize that we can't do it on our own. We can't overcome these offenses just on our own. God, I need your help getting over being easily offended. I need your help getting over being easily offended. Ephesians chapter four, verse two, it's an incredible verse. I love this verse. It says this, always, everybody say always. Always Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, 
And then I'll, I really love this. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Making allowance for each other's faults. I'm just curious. Does anybody in here know anybody that's perfect? Don't think so. Then why do we actually demand perfection out of the people that we love? Just make, make allowance for. When people mess up, when they, when they make a mistake, we're, we're usually the ones that are instantly there. Oh, look, you shouldn't have done that. You messed up. Matter of fact, I had a guy come tell me yesterday. He's like, man, Pastor Shannon, I need to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He said, man, I just want to let you know that, man, I just messed up. I did something I wasn't supposed to do. And I said, okay, well, you know, are, are, you, you, know, um, are you sorry that you did it? He was like, well, of course I am. You regret that you did it? Well, yeah. Well, are you letting it affect you still? No. Are you still doing it? No, I'm not doing it anymore. I said, well, then what's the problem? Because what I see is somebody who's righteous who has fallen, but they've gotten back up again. And that's exactly what Scripture calls us to do. But make allowance for one another's faults. You know, I think it's funny how we actually judge other people by their actions, but we want other people to judge us by our intentions. Oh, look what you did. Look what you said. But the moment that is said to us, we're like, well, well, I know I said that, but you know my heart. I really didn't mean that. Oh, you did this. Well, uh, I know I did that, but you know what? You know me. I wouldn't have ever done anything to really hurt you. It wasn't my intention to do that. We want to judge everybody else by their actions, but we want to be judged by our intentions. But I believe it's time to start giving people the benefit of the doubt. And here's what I mean by that. You see, other people's actions, the way that they kind of treat us whenever they are unkind, unfriendly, short, inattentive, lacking empathy, their bad response is not all about you. Their bad day is not about you. Their bad driving is not an attempt to offend you and ruin your day. Their rude remark isn't about you. The fact that they walked in without saying thank you, it's not about you. Whenever I actually get in that place where I could be easily offended, what I'm starting to do is recognize the fact that this person might be going through something. And so instead of living with the offense, instead of allowing it to attach itself to me, I'm thinking, man, I wonder what that guy's feeling right now. I wonder why he's hurting right now. Man, I wonder what his story is. God, would you allow me to have an opportunity to maybe just speak into his life to encourage him? Or better yet, how about, man, I'm just going to pray for this guy because obviously they are going through something. You see, we, we, we refocus not on that these people are trying to just, you know, hurt us and out to get us, but we focus on the fact that hurt people hurt people, but we need to get to why they're hurting. And we can begin to pray for them. So instead of immediately taking an offense, what I want to do is have the attitude of Christ. I want to have compassion on someone because I'm getting over being easily offended. The second prayer, if you're taking notes, is this. Number two, God, I need your help getting over the big offenses. Now, I want to spend some time being very gentle here. As I said before, I know there are those of you that have had a very significant wound maybe in your life. I know that for a lot of you, especially going into Christmas time, man, this stirs up, right, betrayals, maybe hurts, maybe abuse, maybe lies that you've experienced. And I know this is very, very real. And, and I want to let you know this. Whenever we've been hurt, we actually have a choice. We have a choice. We can either choose to rehearse and replay the hurt, and we get in those situations. And I know I, I do it all the time. Whenever someone offends me or whenever someone hurts me, I'm rehearsing, man, whenever I see them again, this is exactly what I'm going to tell them. If I'm ever in a room with just two, the two of us, here's how it's going to go down. And I even create the whole conversation out in my head. I don't know if that's you, but I do that. I rehearse it over and over and over again. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say this. We have that choice. We have, choose, we have the choice to rehearse it or we can choose to release it. We can, give it, we can give it to God. It's called forgiveness. Matter of fact, Colossians 3.13, check this out. This is another amazing verse. It says this, make allowance for each other's faults. There it is again, right? I'm not just pulling one scripture out and saying, look, here it is. Here's another place. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive. He just dropped the F-bomb. 
forgive. That don't sound right. Forgive anyone that offends you. Now, I know right now you're probably thinking about somebody. There's somebody in your life that has offended you, that has hurt you, and you're probably thinking about them right now. What are we supposed to do? Well, if we continue on, it says, remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. How do you do that? How do you, how do you forgive someone that maybe seems unforgivable? You know, how do you forgive someone? And man, you can, like I said earlier, you can talk about me all you want, but when you bring my wife into this or you bring my, my kids into this, it's a whole nother story. Like we throw in down. How do you forgive? We forgive as Christ forgave us. We forgive about how Christ forgave us. And, I, and I, I'm just thinking right now that I can't speak for you. I can only speak for, for me, but I know that I've messed up a lot. I've needed a lot of forgiveness in my life. There are times where I've let people down. There are times where I've done stuff that, um, that I know that was disobedient to not only my family, but it really hurt the heart of God. I know there are seasons in my life where I've went through times where like, I was doing all kinds of things that weren't, um, that weren't really, um, really good things to be doing as a son of God. I've needed a lot of forgiveness in my life. And because I know that I need forgiveness, I need to be just as gracious to forgive others. You know, Jesus actually says it like this. There, there's a time in, in Luke's gospel where there is this lady who comes into the dinner whenever the, uh, the disciples are with Jesus and some of the other Pharisees and they're having a dinner and the lady comes in and, she, and she's weeping and she's crying and she brings this perfume and she breaks the perfume and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with the perfume and her hair. And then the disciples and some of the people around are like, man, Jesus, I don't think if you really knew how much of a sinner that girl was, I don't think you'd be letting her touch your feet. But Jesus says this. He says, those who have been forgiven much, love much. She knows how much she's been forgiven, so that's why she's showing me love. And then he goes on to say, for those who have been forgiven little, also love little. You see, a lot of us, sometimes we feel like, well, I'm a good person. I, I can do, you know, a, a whole lot, and I just needed God to come for, through for me just a little bit. You see, when we think we've only been forgiven little, we're only going to love little. But for all of us in the room here that, that realize that we've been forgiven of a lot, that aren't sitting there just polishing our halos and acting like this isn't about you, I'm telling you, when we recognize that we have been forgiven a ton, and we've needed God forgive us, it only causes us to love all the more. We forgive as we have been forgiven. You know, here's the deal. With God's help, we can continue to say, I'm getting over it. Whether it's small offenses, whether it's big offenses, I'm getting over it. I'm getting over it. Right earlier, Rene Descartes, I'm going to rise my soul so high that the offense, offense cannot reach it. You know, we're going to be people that actually go out forgiving uh, others because we recognize how much we have been forgiven. Our life is too short. Our calling is too great to live offended. And then one day, we're going to continue to say, you know what, I'm getting over it. I'm getting over it. I'm getting over it. But there's going to come a time with God's help that we're no longer saying, man, I'm getting over it. I'm getting over it. There's going to come a time where we say, I'm over it. With God's help, I am over this thing. I'm not allowing it to offend me and to weigh me down anymore. You know, it's kind of like this. Uh, if I could take you anywhere in Scripture, tell you any story, the, the first one that I thought of as I was putting this message together was the story of Joseph. And I don't want to just assume that everybody knows the story of Joseph in the Bible. So let me just recap it for you very briefly. And so in the Old Testament, there is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Kind of the patriarchs of the Jewish faith. And Jacob actually has 12 sons. And one of them, his name was Joseph. And Jacob actually loved Joseph a ton. He gave him actually this coat to signify his love for him. And Joseph had this dream one day, and he dreamed that uh, his brothers were bowing down to him. Now, he woke up for this dream, and he probably did something he shouldn't have done. He ran straight to his brothers to tell them, hey, one day you're going to bow down to me. I'm just saying, maybe not the smartest thing to do in the moment. So they're all out in the field, um, working the fields and tending to the sheep and all that. The whole, all the brothers are out there, and they, de they decide and come up with this scheme to get rid of Joseph, right? Nobody wants somebody like that in their family, right? So they end up 
throwing Joseph down into this pit. And they devised this plan where they pour blood on the coat and they were going to take it back to their dad and say, man, an animal got him. A lion attacked him. He's dead. I'm sorry. Well, the brothers kind of talked about it and decided, you know what, we probably shouldn't just leave him for dead. And so at that moment, they see this caravan uh, of people kind of going through their land. And so they, they look and they decide, you know what, let's take Joseph, let's sell him into slavery. So Joseph has went from the pit now to slavery. He's now taken off to Egypt and sold to another person named Potiphar. He ends up serving Potiphar, and he's a great servant, a great godly servant. But there comes another problem. Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with Joseph, and he kinda, she kind of seduced him, and he's like, I don't want no part of this. He ran out of there, and then Potiphar's wife told Potiphar, hey, this guy was trying to come into my bed, so he actually now gets thrown into prison. So the pit, slavery, now Joseph's in prison. Crazy, right? And Well, Joseph had this ability to interpret dreams, and so he's interpreting um, these two dudes' dreams that were uh, in the jail with him. One of them happened to be the cupbearer of the Pharaoh. He gets out. The Pharaoh has a dream, needs somebody to interpret it, and the cupbearer says, oh, I know a guy. So they, he, he goes and gets Joseph. He interprets this dream, and Pharaoh loves him, actually appoints him to second in command over all of Pharaoh. I know that was a little bit lengthy description, but I had to get all that. Joseph went from the pit to the prison. Now he's in the palace. Well, his brothers who think that he's dead actually had to come in to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. Because of Joseph's dream, Egypt actually had food to provide for everybody else. And so his brothers came expecting some bread, expecting uh, to be fed, but they see Joseph. Now, Joseph, in this moment, if, if he would have been someone who would have just been rehearsing it and rehearsing it and rehearsing it, he would be like, oh, when I see them again, oh, I'm going to pay them back. Oh, I'm going to kill them. I'm going to take them out. We would have a much different story. But what happens is his brothers come in, seize him, doesn't recognize that it's his brother at first because that whole process took 14 years, 14 years in the pit and in prison before he got to the palace, 14 years. And so Joseph actually reveals himself, says, look, it's me. It's your brother, the one who you thought was dead, who you just threw in the pit and sold into slavery. It's me. And of course, they're like, oh my gosh, he's going to kill us. He's going to take us out. What are we going to do? Then Joseph said, no, 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 no. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, it says, what you meant for harm, God used for good. What you meant for evil, man, my God, he turned it. He turned it in such a way that I was actually able to bless people in the entire region. Matter of fact, God used me to save hundreds of thousands of people. What you meant for harm, God meant for good. I'm over that. I'm not harboring bitterness. Yeah, you did a lot of things that I could have taken offense at. Throw me in the pit, got sold into slavery, went to prison. But that's not what I'm going to focus on, right? I'm going to raise my soul so high that the offense cannot reach it. I'm over it. I'm over it. Here's the thing. I believe that God will use things in our life. He'll, he'll use even the places that, that we're wounded and hurt in. He'll use the offense, offenses where we're saying, you know what? Yeah, what used to weigh me down does no longer weigh me down. The offenses and hurts in my life has actually helped to conform me to be more like Christ. And so I'm gonna just recognize right now, my life is too short. My calling is too great to live offended. Here's what I like to do actually as we, as we close this first week. You know, I, I want you to actually understand how much we've been forgiven. And I actually wanna take you to what I'm gonna call the greatest offense that ever happened. And it happened in the very beginning. Romans chapter five actually says this. It says, through one man's offense, talking about Adam, when he disobeyed God, right? Ate of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they weren't supposed to do. Romans five, it says, through one man's offense, sin entered into the world. And then death because of sin. But then it goes on to say, but by one man's righteous act, 
grace now overflows to the many. And I love that verse because he's, Paul's talking about the righteous act of Jesus. How not only he came, and this is what we're celebrating, right? Christmas, that Jesus came and he came not only, um, not only to just uh, uh, live the perfect life of obedience to the Father, but he came ultimately to die on the cross. That's the one act of righteousness that Jesus did on our behalf. He went to the cross, bloodied and beaten. They put a thorn of, or a, a crown of thorns into his head. Matter of fact, Isaiah said he was beaten so bad and whipped so bad, he didn't even have the appearance of a man anymore. And here is creation crucifying the creator. Think about that. And Jesus looks down and he actually says this says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Father, forgive them. And if Jesus can forgive an offense like that, look, the cross was offensive. It was an instrument of death, but it says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and now he's sitting down at the right hand of the Father. He knew what the cross would represent and mean for us. So yes, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came, born of a virgin, was placed in a manger, but ultimately, he came to one day be raised upon that tree, upon that cross for us. He overcame the great offense so that we can overcome the offenses in our life as well. Guys, I hope you remember, your life is too short. Your calling is too great to live offended. So this Christmas, let's go into it with an attitude of showing grace because you've received grace. Showing love because you know how much you've been loved showing forgiveness, knowing how much you've been forgiven. Let's pray. Father, I just come before you. <clears throat> and I'm just thankful for the gift that you are. I just pray that just in your presence, God, just even right now that you would do a work in all of our hearts. God, I know that it's so easy for so many of us to be easily offended by the things that are insignificant, things that don't really matter that much. God, I pray by your grace that you would give us the ability to overlook, to pass over, to rise above the things that would slow us down. And God, for those who are significantly hurting today, we would ask that you would, would give them the power to forgive as we've been forgiven, to release it, not to rehearse it, to give it to you, you know, right now, I just want to take a moment to talk to those of you as we're continuing in prayer, just in those places where you would say, you know what, Shannon? I've been a little bit like you. I can be easily offended. If that's you, would you just raise your hand in this moment? I want help overcoming the easy offenses. Now, those of you who today would say, you know what, I'm, I'm carrying right now a significant wound one of the bigger offenses, and I really need God's help to let that one go. If that's you, would you raise your hand in this place? I'm gonna pray for you as well. Father, today I ask that just in your presence, you would do a work in our heart. God, for some of us, I believe that even now, we're just gonna say that, you know, I'm getting over it. Not just that, but I am over it. I'm over it. God, by the power of your risen son, help us, God, to rise above the small offenses. For the deeper ones, God, I know it, it took months, maybe even years for me to overcome one. I pray, God, that, that you would do a process of healing that would start right now, that you would speed up the process even, that you would help us to choose to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who harm us. God, I pray that you would help us to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to truly just be Christmas to the people around us. God, as we've been forgiven so much, give us the supernatural ability because that's what it takes to forgive others as we've been forgiven. And we thank you that when we forgive, we are set free. We're set free. Give us the power, give us the grace to forgive as we've been forgiven. And I pray for supernatural testimonies to come from it in Jesus' name. Amen.